Well, the stock market has finally done it. A 4,900 was reached over the last 24 hours. And of course, that led into some large options trades coming through. But what were they? Today, we'll discuss that along with Tesla's big result, warning the street of a slower year of growth ahead and sending the stock tumbling right back down. As we discussed, it was a plus minus 8% move that we were expecting, and it looks like we're reaching for the support. Will we get underneath and will this offer day trading and swing trading opportunities ahead? Today, we'll discuss all of those things along with the market that starts to rebound. Yes, the Chinese market sold off brutally in the back end of 2023, might have just seen the low for the year. Today, we'll discuss the kind of rally that we're starting to get through and where the stocks are starting to improve across the board in the wake of terrible news. Join us as we cover stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. Well, welcome back, everyone, to The Daily Show, where we talk about markets around the world. As always, we'll be covering the macro, the lead indicators, and the hottest charts. There's so much to discuss, including dark pool activity and some massive levels coming up. But, of course, it was the last 24 hours that we need to talk about straight away, and that was mostly some technology going up, and energy stocks. The rest was, let's just say, a little bit sally, and breadth was not really doing very well. As we've already seen with many breadth indicators, this one being a Goldman Sachs one, the current breadth of the market is not what you would call robust. 24 on the read, average is around 35. So we're really looking for more stocks to start to play in this rally, but let's talk about why the rally is occurring and more importantly, whether it's going to slow down anytime soon. Well, of course, corporate clients are a huge deal in the back end of 2023. We start to see buybacks by corporations and this was at historical high levels. Now, as we know, markets love a good buyback and they tend to buy into them. So that's a huge reason why we're starting to see markets going up. Another one has to do with financial conditions. We've already been hearing a lot about how the Federal Reserve and central banks around the world are going to cut rates, and they are, and they will be this year. However, at the same time, financial conditions are getting a lot easier. And what that basically means is that we might be starting to see a potential stimulation of demand from the loosening. And we're already starting to see that through lending in particular. I've been talking with quite a few mortgage brokers and it's getting easier and easier to get home loans in comparison to where you were only a few months ago. So new highs happening in clusters. This is a great one to keep on the books and make sure to take a screenshot of this because really what it's showing you is that when we start to make new highs in markets, there are usually a few more years to come in terms of rallies with pullbacks being met by bull demands. We've already talked about the stats and how you have to remain, relatively speaking, optimistic when it comes to the rest of the year. And that's because we're in an election year. Election years have never had a recession in them ever in recorded history. And also, we tend to have a very strong lead if we get start things such as Wayne's toy two-month showing bullish patterns. And it did this show year again with a 35 and 2 ratio in terms of how many times we've seen bulls by the end of the year. And of course, usually weakness in the first quarter and sometime around that October, September period in the year. So if you're looking for pullbacks, it's either going to be sometime in the next two months or generally it'll be later on this year. Now, how could we see a pullback? Well, we've been talking a little bit about CTAs and I was reading a few comments yesterday in the chat down below and a lot of you are saying, what, what are CTAs? Well, they're commodity trading advisors and basically it's like they're professional managers similar to like portfolio managers or mutual funds. So Generally speaking, if they're kind of really heavily bullish, it's considered, you would say, a bullish statistic. And if they start to go bearish, you would say, well, maybe flow is starting to come out of the markets. Now, what I like to say here is when they're super overbought, it's like any other indicator. As long as they remain super overbought, markets can rally up. But you'll notice that when things start to turn on the CTA side, you'll want to be paying attention. And of course, we will have that data here on the show. So make sure to subscribe for that with updates right now showing that they're basically sideways. Could they be going down on sales? I'd say they will be, but of course that would be a prediction and we haven't seen it yet. They're just kind of like stabilized at this point in time. So we talked about China markets a couple of times this week and last week, and rightfully so, I believe, as we're heading into Chinese New Year, and usually that needs to bring a little bit of cheer as it's the biggest, biggest holiday event over in China, and obviously it means that everybody's going to be catching up with their families. What a great time to try to release some positive data, and that's what they're starting to do, stimulating the economy as much as they can, and obviously it is very bad over there. 
In fact, I've spoken to some people and they've said they've never seen it quite so bad. But on the flip side of that, you've got to remember some stocks are down as much as 90% from their highs with kind of the 70 to 80% down being in some ways almost the average across so many tech stocks. So have we ever seen this record divergence before? No, we've never seen a ratio where we've had the US stock market so strong and of course the Chinese stock market so weak. Now you could argue that this is the new norm. Uh, I would say though that there is a good chance that potentially we're seeing a point where we may be coming into the bottom in 24 at some point, maybe it's already happened. And a lot of these reasons are because you might say, well, GDP, that's the thing, it's shrinking, it's shrinking. Yes, but we have seen markets stabilize if not go up heavily during a shrinking GDP. And a lot of that's because the market's already preempted this bad news. Remember, by the time you're hearing about it, it generally has already been heard by the market and the algorithms and everything else that's going on have already started trading it, if not been packing it in for quite some time. We are given limited information and that's why we need to be following price action as the ultimate indicator and usually not making too many predictions. And you would argue, of course, this is a prediction, but we want to see price action come our way as well. Now, we know that the Hang Seng Index got absolutely brutalized into capitulation about last week, and that usually two weeks later, we've got a market that may have seen its bottom. In fact, over the next six months, 80% of the time, the market has rebounded. So pretty much fear hitting its peak over in China at this stage. And rightfully so, you can see here the two biggest concerns at least in terms of the news and everybody else's opinion right now, has to be US shadow banking, which is private credit and bad lending, you would have to think. And then of course, China real estate. Now you may remember in 2023, everybody had US commercial real estate as their main problem. Well, don't worry guys, that's according to general pundits, the thing that is not a concern anymore. And of course, US government debt, Bank of Japan and others are making up the top of the list. So generally, you know, with a black swan event, it might be in plain sight, but it's not usually the one we're all talking about that causes the issue. And I would always keep that in the back of your mind. So we talked about the first five trading days also being a good read for the rest of the year. Of course, we're specifically using it at this stage being a negative first five trading days to kind of show that there could be weakness and strength and all sorts of things going on the first quarter. And we still expect that the first quarter is going to be quite volatile. And while the markets are rallying up right now, we do tend to see sales come through. These are the scenarios that can happen, including open fields for the election year and, of course, sitting, sitting president running, etc. Generally speaking, there will be some form of sell in the Q1, though. Now, traditionally, it's happened in that kind of Feb-March period or early in January. And this year, of course, we're not following. We had like a sell, but then we've had a rally since then. So maybe it's going to be Feb until we see proper selling occur. We'll have to be following the price action as much as possible. Now, this is a worrying chart for anybody that knows something about options. Obviously, the puts are getting out of control and they're mostly sold puts. So basically, credit, come, I'm going to put this in the next video. You would be surprised how many exchange traded funds are getting opened that are based on credit selling. Now, I'm a massive fan of credit selling. I've actually been doing it for well over a decade and it's been one of my favorite strategies in terms of the slower growth strats that you can use. But the thing about this is that it seems like everybody's starting to do it and specifically, it's been one of the best strategies over the last 12 months. Now, with so many people getting into sold puts, you've got to think that there is an event or a crisis period that will come this year. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is the reason why we end up getting some kind of little flash crash that comes through. And uh, yeah, it is off the scale at this point. So keep on top of that. We will update you as we see it. But another strong week here in terms of puts. Then comes the day. So what happened with the zero DTEs, which obviously can be great for day traders? Well, it was just really, we hit 4,900, couldn't quite breach through that level. We got to like 4,904 and then we came back down to the 4,870 zone. So not really a very strong day, I would say, in terms of being able to read what was going on in the options underneath the hood. But uh, yeah, 4,870 obviously acting as a bit of a support. Now, why was 4,900 a key level? Look at the call sitting on top of it. If we breach, we close the daily above 4,900, get ready for 49.50 and then 5K. 5K probably being the biggest next level on the charts. This is similar to what we saw at 4,800 where, of course, we were looking for potential shorts being around that zone. But as soon as it breached, it went positive gamma to a maximum degree 
and 4850, 4900 became the next key levels. And of course, those two 50-point zones were hit very, very quickly. So this remains at 4900. A close above there should expose upwards of 5K. And unfortunately, the trend will keep going up if you are thinking it's going bearish at that point because that's really the way the options have been playing at this stage. So we've kicked off what I would call major earnings now. Tesla kicking it off. Obviously, the Mag 7 needing to do a lot of the heavy lifting, expected to grow, grow heavily. And over the next couple of weeks, we're starting to see Microsoft and Apple and those other big ones. And that will create incredible volatility. Do be aware of what's coming up because we can just already see that Tesla had an effect on the markets and it was within that plus minus kind of like 7%, moving a little bit less than that, but still a very volatile day. So I do expect huge moves coming forward. And I think we all do with the overall uh, earnings results coming out of these companies, whether it be good or bad. Let's now have a look at what's going on from large trades. Now this is a bull 3X fund and we saw a large big move here. This is 3X IWM, which is the Russell 2000. And we've already seen the Russell struggle for two days, creating big wicks around this area here. Now, why is that important? Well, it's kind of a rejection coming through the top. We do expect that if it comes down a little bit more, probably seeing larger traders trying to get involved. And possibly this is a larger trader trying to get a buy into the markets. It could be a sell as well. Um, I'm looking to see what happens. If we get like that, then I'm going to go with, it's going to be quite bullish. I remember with trading... It's not so much your opinion. You've got to kind of see the weight of evidence. So at this point, there is a large trade coming through on the Russell for sure. And we have two weak rejections, kind of suggesting that we might have a little bit more of a sell-off there before we get a rally, but there are still key points. What about Soxel? This is a 3X semiconductor fund. And you can see here, two large trades came in after a little bit of selling that happened through the session. And they really kind of lined in with around that 37 to 37.50. Again, could it be a buy? It's certainly possible. It fell underneath that previous support. Price action over the next 24 hours could be very, very important for this. And then we get treasuries, which we already know are trading at very demanded zones. It, it's my guess that these are large funds buying um, because we had that pullback. We already expected 4.2%, which is where we are with the US 10 year. And we'll look at that very, very soon to find some kind of buyer. And overall, this is an area where there could be an accumulation from the street. Remember, it's sold off. I wouldn't mind it to make a new low, snap off some of these low periods, and then start to make a new high. And if that happens, it could be a really great sign for treasuries for the year ahead. What about unusual options activity? Well, I just wanted to really bring this up because it was still huge. 44.7 versus 39.8 on average, 58% calls coming through as well. And you'll notice there was a lot of unusual activity. NVIDIA notably getting heaps of calls on it going up to 613. It's almost already at its 12-month target, which Wall Street has set at around 660 for that stock. So it's still flying high. Then we saw Tesla selling off during the day. Obviously, that's going to get a ton of options activity on it over the next 24 hours with big moves, I would say, being in the intraday. And then we have some interesting ones here, such as the TQQ coming back in with some big bets on it. Uh, now, it was actually fairly even. We got a little bit more calls than puts, but 2.29 times volume. So some large trades starting to come through here for some ETFs. And I would say some people are trying to position both on the bull side for 5K on the S&P and the bear side saying, you know what? I think it's getting so close. Maybe everyone's getting a little bit too excited because there are some risks. Let's talk about each one of those right now. First up, we've got here the S&P 500 versus central bank liquidity. And you'll notice in central bank liquidity, it's kind of been hovering. Have we made, reached a new high? No. So in general, yes, the markets are up, but they're not really pulling along with central bank liquidity. And this could suggest that if we keep seeing these go down and markets go sideways, that's actually a fairly clear sign that there's weakness that's about to come into the price action. If it does, that's a good trigger. Let's move over to US 10 year. US 10 year hitting 4.2, very important level for it. This area here is really where you would expect yields to start turning to the downside again. If they spike through 4.3, that's going to be a pretty bad sign for markets. And I would expect that to be a catalyst that probably starts to break the markets across the board. Treasuries sitting around 93, pretty good heavy zone for somebody that's a swing trader or an investor. This area is pretty good. I mean, obviously, it's a return back from that 100 uh, upside could be around 110 still for the end of the year on treasuries, but they're not really a trade. I've always said that they're more of a 
Uh, specifically, they're more of a usually investment or multi-month, multi-month kind of uh, vehicle. Let's move over to bond bond kind of markets to see where the risk is getting higher or lower. It's completely neutral, so nothing much there. And off the back of some stimulation from China, we're seeing copper you know, kind of reignite. We're also seeing iron ore following along with suit with some great trades coming through BHP, Rio, Vale, and a few others in terms of strength uh, that we've seen in recent days. Now, where are the concerns? Dow Jones transportation average, that had a big rally up, bit of a sell-off now. Nothing notable yet, but certainly there. And then there's home builders. Now, we just had one of the construction ETFs get a massive trade on it. And you would have to think that's probably a sell based on the fact that home builders have outperformed everything except for basically semiconductors over the last four months. That's unusual. And this could be still a Wyckoff. We've got a one, two, three, which I like to look at. We have a potential buying climax, UTU TAD, in terms of scenario. And I certainly don't like what I see on home builders. Look, last week I talked about this being a potential sell zone because I think the trend changed. And at this stage, it looks you know, kind of bad really on a chart. So of course, lows such as 91 will need to be closed below to confirm, but it's a key level and certainly one that I'm looking at on the charts quite closely because if home builders start failing, it could mean the market's not too far along from giving a mean reversion. It's a pretty good indicator. Let's move over to the US dollar. The US dollar strength, this is in line with what we've been talking about. Nice little rejection off the 20 moving average. Obviously, it pulled back, came up. Still looking for 103.80 to 104 for the US dollar. So that's looking like it's trying to go up with the yields. Then we come to gold, which fell off. Now, gold keeps trading around this most traded zone. You can see each time it's finding resistance around here. If you were selling that zone each time, I guess you did pretty well. And we're back down to 2015. Now, I'm, you know, this is where a buyer is going to come in if they're going to try, uh, but it is going to be a little bit more difficult considering the process. So considering what happened before. This down to 2015, then rally would have been much better. Obviously, we saw GDX, which is a gold um, gold stock fund ETF. It, it, that actually found some nice island reversal, and that was something that we've been looking at on the charts, but it did sell off after reaching 29 in the previous session. So you can see here, little gap down, little gap up, and then a brutalization. Yeah, it's a little bit worrying here for gold. Again, this is where you know a swing trader with the biggest stop loss is still going to like it, but notice the 20 moving average sold off. Same with spot. It's having a bit of problems. There are some decent signs here. Things like oil slowly grinding up. I feel like we've been talking about this one. It's like watching paint dry almost, uh, but it has been between 70, 50 and 75. That's actually not that small a range for the barrel. And the barrel looks like it keeps moving higher with weak rejections coming off the lows. And of course, 75 being the highest close we've seen in some time equal to pretty much over here. More closes and the higher we go, 78 is open. And then of course we go to 82 to 84 a barrel after that, which could be very interesting. Tesla, now this stock had a bad after hours and we kind of thought there would either be a rally into this and then possible sell from there, or we'd dump into this support, probably take it, make a new low and then find buyers. That's something I'd be looking for in the next 24 hours in terms of if I was a day trader, this stock is worthwhile. Often patience and reaction after the uh, actual event itself can be the best. And I'm sure some day traders will be looking for structure down in here and replication strategies if they're looking for that buy. Maybe it's an overreaction to the warning to the street. Remember, the stock has already sold into this event as well. It's not like Tesla's been doing super well from the top to where it is now, from even just over here. It's down around 35%. So this stock, 194 very interesting level. I'm looking forward to getting, making a video on that over the next 24 hours when we when we find out how it trades around that area on open. Now let's move over to China. Now this is the traditional stock everyone looks to. Baba, so cheap, yeah? Everybody always goes, oh, the fundamentals are so good on it. Look, it's not my favorite stock in the market, but we did see an island reversal, which is a gap down, gap up kind of scenario. We obviously have a trend line on the way down. That's a terrible line, but you get my point. And of course, we have an alert here that I've got set for $78. Now, all of this is happening into Chinese New Year. Obviously, this is not the only market. If we look at the Hang Seng, which is one of the other markets we've been watching, CQQ, any of those things, they've come down to key supports. And you can see that it has made some changes. Now, I reported in the last 24 hours that this was a big level and breaching this zone was probably going to bring the bulls. And it has so far. Uh, I could still see it pulling back and then doing something like this. 
So it's a fledgling, very small time, but notice that actually the volume has started to spike across the board. And that volume is in most things. So whether you're looking at something like Barber, whether you're looking at JD, whether you're looking at CQQ or anything else, there's a little bit of interest coming into China at around these lows. What do you think in the comments down below though? Do you think that it's actually found its low for the year or is the worst still to come even though those stocks are sold off between 70 and 90%? Let's now have a look at the Australian market. Still at resistance, nothing much. Long leg doji, obviously waiting for the US to give lead. German market pushes through. Now, it is back at resistance, you could say here, but pushing through the most traded zone, kind of a bullish sign for it. I don't know if I'd be involved in this type of thing, but this is, you know, in many ways a flag, which could point to a serious rally coming through. I find that when something looks this good, it often doesn't happen though. So <laughs> um, I would probably not be on it. We talked about whether we got any kind of sell from the most traded zone. Remember, patience was key here. No alerts triggered and therefore you wouldn't have gotten squeezed out from this one. But the German market definitely did squeeze. Let's have a look at the US 2K. Two rejections, big trade here, as we know. Key level here, I think, for bulls if they're going to come back in, which sits around that uh, price range of 1940. So interesting level here for the Russell. Two weak rejections off the high. Doesn't look great on a chart, but if it's going to find buyers, something like that would be sweet. And breaching this should open up here and our watch reaction zone. So that will probably mean that 5K is incoming for the S&P um, should we see that kind of movement on the US 2K. The NASDAQ, so it rallied, then sold off. First week in a while. So this is a decent week here. It usually shows that someone was trying to short and weeks can sometimes show a topping or a sidewaysing market. So I do think it's only the first sign, but a big week coming in the NASDAQ, a big week coming in the US 500, and certainly a little bit concerned because, of course, it's coming through 4,900, which we already knew was a big call resistance. If we breach this, I still think 5K is the next zone. Uh, if we start to sell off, where are we going to see buyers? Well, it's quite simply going to be around that 20 moving average. So 20 moving average, key level, previous resistance becoming support, all sorts of role reversal and other concepts, supply demand concepts that could come in. So if the sell comes to 4,800, remember 4,800, 4,810 has a lot of options activity on it that could be beneficial for the markets. Then we move over to Bitcoin. Pretty much, I would say everyone's cottoned on to this being a potential Wyckoff now. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the reaction here. Maybe we'll one of the first together to, uh, to really say that buy the rumor, sell the fact was very likely here for the crypto market. Uh, and look, it does continue to look relatively weak. Obviously, some rejection weeks such as this bullish hammer. But I think the interesting thing here is going to be when we break down this time slot. So you can see here that we've got a market coming down and then it breaches back up and it makes a little bit of a high. Now, that's suggesting that maybe a day trade is going to try to pick it up off a 39.3 or something like that. It's the first time frame that you could even see some type of bulls. Uh, but you've got big issues, 42K just underneath that and 43K being big bear zones. So I wouldn't mind to see either of these types of things occur down into the up. And a lot of the time, these are the areas where you're finding whether you feel like there's actually some kind of e uh, edge for you. And there's no edge, even if you might have an inkling to which direction it might go, I don't really trade. If you come from an abundance mindset, there's always another opportunity, guys, everywhere. I mean, we've, we cover so many stocks here, so many commodities, currencies, all sorts of things, you're going to see 10, 20 opportunities a week. It's up to you to pick which ones actually have greater edge on them. So in that light of that and everything that's going on, we do have some big news coming forward, obviously a little bit of GDP stuff. Then we've got the ECB press conference at 8.45 New York time. So that 8 to 9 a.m. is going to be big New York. And then we've got core PCE price index 8.30 on Friday, Jan 26. So that's the big news for the week ahead. The biggest earnings being Tesla is now out of the way. Obviously, Netflix did much better. And I think that at this point, you know, there are lots of opportunities and then maybe not even in the major indices. There are individual stocks, sectors, other markets around the world, and possibly even a couple of commodities there. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up, smash that like button, as I said, and so I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up and of course, smash that subscribe button and alert and we'll see you with another video after the close on Friday. Thanks so much. Bye for now.